Let me remind you of a little of the nomenclature that we defined about the camera obscura. So again, we have a, a box. Um, at the front of the box is a small aperture, just a very, very small hole. Uh, at the back of the box, we have a photosensitive material that is going to record the image. We define the distance between the photosensitive material and the aperture as the focal length and the ray that is perpendicular to the photosensitive material, the back of the box, and goes through the aperture is called the optical axis. And we have some intuition as to how images are formed. Light out here in the world uh, enters into the pinhole camera, into the aperture rather, and strikes the sensor. And an image is formed here. But we want to be a little more precise about this because in computer vision, we want to be able to reason about the physical world out here. And to do that, we need more precision than rays come in and strike the bat. We need to be able to say, given something out here in the world at some position, where will it show up up here in the image or vice versa? Given something in here in the image, where might it be out here in the three-dimensional world? So we can reason about the world from the image. So we need some coordinate systems, so let's get started. We're gonna have two coordinate systems here. The first coordinate system is the world coordinate system. This is defined by X, Z. By the way, notice I'm in a two-dimensional world here. I've, I've lost the Y dimension. We're gonna do everything in 2D, and then I'm gonna show you that this generalizes to 3D very easily. So think flat land or flat world here. There's only two dimensions out in the physical world. And of course that means that the sensor is one dimensional. We'll generalize to 3D world, 2D sensor in a little bit. So I have a world coordinate system. Points are specified by their X coordinate in capital letters. All world coordinates will be in world, all world coordinates will be in capital letters. And then it has a Z dimension, which is how far it is along the optical axis. Notice this is a very special coordinate system. I've defined it so that the, hor the, the horizontal axis is parallel to the sensor and the, the other axis, the Z axis, is along the optical axis. That's coordinate system one. We are going to specify things in the world in this XZ two-dimensional coordinate system. We have another coordinate system, which is the image coordinate system. I've, de I've denoted that with a little x here. Image coordinates will be lowercase, world coordinates will be uppercase. And here again, it's a very special coordinate system. The origin is again on the optical axis, and its, its axis is parallel to the capital X coordinate system of the world. And I'm gonna define the focal length to be a uh, little f here, which is again, the distance from the front of the camera to the back of the camera. So why did I define these coordinate systems? Because I'm gonna put something out here in the world and I'm going to image it and I'm going to ask, well, for some point in the world specified by some coordinate, what is the coordinate in the image? All right, let's see how that works. So out here in the world, I'm going to define a point to be capital P, again, capital letters, and it's a point XZ. Let me just say something a little bit about this notation here. I could have done this as X comma Z as a point in a world. I like vectors, and so I'm gonna denote this as a column vector, X, Z. It's exactly the same. It's just two points specified by this direction and this direction. So I have some point out here, capital P, and notice that I've put a little vector on top of that to remind me that this is a two-dimensional quantity. Now, we're gonna, let's play the game of camera obscura or pinhole camera. There's a ray that goes from that point through the aperture and strikes the photosensitive material. At some point, little x. Now, for a point out in the world, what is that little x? I would like to determine that because I, again, wanna understand this relationship between where things are in the world and where they emerge in the image. All right, so let's see what we have here. We need a little geometry. Little geometry, triangles are your friends. They're always your friends in geometry. So let's look at these two triangles. This point out here is defined by the triangle with height x and with length z. Um, so notice from the aperture to the point down to the optical axis is a small triangle. I have another triangle here, which goes from the aperture, focal length distance out here, small x down and back up. So now I have a triangle with length f, height little x. I have another with height big x and length big z. And these of course are similar triangles. So I can say something about their relationship. And in particular, 
what I can say is that big X over big Z, that triangle right there, is equal to minus little x over little f. So forget about the minus sign for a second. Let's just make sure we understand the ratio. All I've said is that since these are similar triangles, their height to length ratios are the same. Where did the minus sign come from? Why is it negated? Well, notice here that remember that the both of the positive x um, coordinates, big x here and little x here, were positive in the x direction. I've got a positive point here, but it's negative here. Why? Because of the inversion. When the ray goes through, it gets inverted. And so we have a negative sign um, on our um, coordinate. By the way, this may seem a little weird that the images are upside down. This thing right here, the human eye, the human brain, does the same thing. This camera does exactly the same thing. And in fact, on the retina, in the back of your eye, everything is upside down. Your brain just doesn't care. It's figured out how to reason about the world, even though the image actually being formed here is upside down. And in a digital camera, same thing. We don't care. We'll just invert the image on the way out of the device. But that's where the negative sign comes from. So let me just write this a little bit differently now. I'm going to write this as uh, little x is equal to minus fx over z. So why did I do this, by the way? I give you a point out in the world, big x, big z. I give you a camera with a known focal length f, and now I have an equation that tells me where is the projection of that point on the back of the camera. It's equal to minus fx over z. This is the so-called perspective projection equation. And what we're gonna see is that even though we're working with a very simple, simple camera here, even modern camera still exhibit this basic uh, perspective projection equation. Okay, good. We understand something now about how to model, a model map points out in the world into the image, and we in fact have an equation for it, which is right here. All right, let's do a little exercise. Um, and you're gonna be seeing these exercises throughout. Um, they're optional. Uh, I recommend strongly that you pause the video and do it. This is a great way to start honing your skills and making sure that you understand the, uh, the, the concepts that we've just introduced. Let me go ahead and just read this to you. Please write me some code that simulates the projection, just the way I described, of a line segment defined by two points, minus fz and fz. So that's xz, xz, I got a, a line out in front of me um, that's separate at some distance z. Where z, how far that is from my virtual camera, ranges from 10 to 1,000. And let's just, for simplicity, assume a camera length, focal length of unit value or one. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is for each distance, 10, 11, 12, 13, up into 1,000, project the two points into a 1D sensor. So figure out for me, please, what is the little x for one part of the line segment and a little x for the other part of the line segment. Um, so project it onto a sensor and compute the length of that segment. So out in the world, let's agree that the length of the segment is always 10. But when you project it, depending on how far it is from the camera, it's going to appear different. And I want you to tell me how long is that segment when you project it into a camera under perspective projection. And then please plot this length as a function of distance and see how the, the size changes as a function of distance. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video, please. And when you come back, I'm gonna show you my solution. And then just one more insight from the, uh, about what that perspective projection means for the image formation process. Okay, I hope you got that. Uh, let me just go through my solution now. So I've done this, of course, in Python. I, um, you can do this in almost any language. These are pretty simple uh, pieces of code, although I recommend you do this in, in Python. So I'm gonna import some libraries over here. Let's come down. I'm gonna define my segment in the world. And here it's really, really important to use consistent notation. Capital letters for the world, lowercase letters for the image so that when you just see the variable name, you will remember that this is a world coordinate, not an image coordinate. So I'm gonna define x1, x2 to be minus five, five, and, and the focal length to be one. Okay, now the z is gonna range from 10 to 1,000. So in this loop right here, I'm gonna go from z is equal to 10 to 1,000, and I'm going to project each point, x1, z, x2, z, under perspective projection. So let's go ahead and do that. So here's x1 minus f x1 over z, perspective projection. x2 is minus f x2 over z. 
So now I have two coordinates, x1 and x2, and I just want to know how long is that line segment. And so I'm going to compute the square root of the square of the distance, just the length of the line. I could have obviously taken the absolute value here because it's a one-dimensional segment. And I'm going to just um, keep appending that into a list because I eventually want to plot it. And now I'm going to go ahead and just plot it here and be a, a, a good scientist and put labels on my plot so I know what I'm looking at. All right, so let's see what we've got over here. So along the horizontal axis is distance from 10 to 1,000. And along the vertical distance is the length of that 1D line. Again, let's agree that when I had that line in the world, move it to and from the camera, it's not changing size. It's always 10 units long. But when I project it, it's, of course, changing size. And notice that the way it's changing is really interesting. It starts off at 1. Uh, why 1, by the way? Well, let's see. The, 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 line, the line is 10 units long, and I start at a distance of 10. So 10 over 10 is 1, and the focal length is 1. So good, there's a nice sanity check here that the length is 1. And notice what happens now is it's going to fall off very quickly, exponentially. It's falling off. Why is that? Well, it's because I'm dividing by z when I project. That's a big, harsh nonlinearity. So it doesn't change linearly. It's not like it goes down in increments. It goes down very quickly. And this, by the way, this, this very rapid change in size as a function of distance is exactly why, when you look at an image, things that are further away are projected smaller. So again, I remember here that we have the tiles. The tiles in the physical three-dimensional world are square. But as they recede away from me, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Think railroad ties. Uh, if you see, ever see a picture of, of railroad tracks, um, they will converge. And they're not converging because they're actually converging in the world. They're converging because of perspective projection. And now we have the equation to explain it, which is that division by z that explains why things get smaller as they move further away from me. All right. Now we have not just a camera obscura and the ability to think about how images are formed, but we now have geometry and algebra to describe that image formation process. I can tell you for some point out in the physical 3D world, so far a 2D world, um, where will it show up in a 1D sensor? And the reason, of course, you want to do that is because it's going to allow us to understand how things out in the world will appear in the image, and then, of course, the reverse problem, which is given that something is in the image, where might it be out in the 3D world? Obviously, a critical thing to understand for computer vision.